everybody. Welcome to another episode of Action Features. It's going to be a little bit different this episode than normal. It's not just me and Mike here. We teased this last show that we would have one of the members of the Four Horsemen Toy Design Group here. And do uh, you want to tell which one you are? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Cornboy, H. Eric Cornboy Mays from Four Horsemen Toy Design. How you guys doing? Very good, man. Very good. Hey, did anybody? does everybody know that you get your name Cornboy from your last name Mays? Is that what you get it from? Well, kind of, kind of. That's what everybody asks, but it's a little bit different story. The nickname Cornboy came from a, um, a Yugoslavian guy that I used to work with at a machine shop when I first moved to New Jersey. He asked me if we uh, had cattle in Indiana, where I'm originally from. And I said, no, we don't really, don't really have cattle. Uh, we have mostly just corn. He goes, oh, so you're a corn boy. And that just kind of <laughs> stuck. And wow. When I... Uh, when I moved to, uh, and, you know, maize does mean corn, but um, in Native American, but um, <clears throat> that w had nothing to do with it, really. That's and then crazy. when I went to McFarland Toys, there was another Eric that worked there. It's Eric Treadaway. And one of the guys that ran the place was like, uh, how am I going to know you two guys apart? Well, you're both Eric's. And I said, well, you can just call me Corn Boy. I was just kind of joking. But it's stuck, and it's just kind of like become my nomenclature for people who know me in the industry now. Now everybody calls me Corn Boy. Even my wife calls me CB sometimes. That's how it happens, man. You can't, you cannot control your nickname. Like that Seinfeld no. episode where yeah, exactly. George tries to get T-Bone, and he can't, <laughs> he can't get it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I've had quite a few nicknames through my my life. So well, easy. Corn this Boy is a is family show. I can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can deal with this one. This one's a good one. Um. Well, I, see, I thought it was being all clever because I remember that Batman the Animated Series episode where uh -huh. he, Mockridge is in the maze. If you're so smart, why are you rich? And he says, uh, right. Because the corn really. And I didn't know at the point when I saw that that maize was corn. Yeah. But then yeah. later on, uh, since then, I've always thought of corn and maize. And when I saw your last name, I just assumed that's what it was for. But I was totally wrong. It has a totally different meaning. You learned something. I learned something new. No, sir. I do have a Native American background, but. Uh... <laughs> And my grandpa changed uh, the spelling of our name um, from the rest of the family because he did not like the other members of his family. Wow. Back before you had to go through courts to do that. But, um, yeah, the the name Maze does actually mean corn, but uh, my name's spelled a little differently from that. All right. Well, that, that, that's it that's, for the show that's today. It, that's, that's all we wanted to talk about was <laughs> how Corn Boy got his name. Um, okay, no. That was so, a good show. Uh, we can't cover everything you guys have done because that would be, we'd be on this show for the next three weeks. Um, yeah. So we're trying to, to just get to just what's current right now, what's currently happening. But just as a okay. little bit of a background for people that may not know, most people listening to the show are going to know who the Four Horsemen are. But in case you don't, they're a awesome toy design studio that started back in the McFarland days. And correct me if I'm wrong anywhere in here, uh, Cornboy. They started back in the McFarland days in the 90s, was it? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, and then you guys went off and did your own design studio, splitting apart from McFarland, and started working for Mattel. You've done work for NECA, and you've done a ton of stuff for yourselves. Um, but And they've covered tons of toy lines. If you've been a collector in the last 15, 20 years, it's almost guaranteed you've owned something that the Four Horsemen have worked on. From Masters of Universe possibly. Classics, uh, the 2000 X Mo2 line, uh, DC Universe Classics, uh, the Movie Masters... Um, all that McFarlane stuff, the NECA Ninja Turtles, the, the comic version Ninja Turtles. There's tons and tons of stuff you guys have worked on. Harry Potter, all these different lines that you guys have contributed to. So NECA's Nightmare Before Christmas. There's a little bit of Toy Biz stuff, uh, Marvel uh, Legends stuff that we did for them here and there. And, you know, we've, we've had our hands in a lot of different pots. We've been very fortunate. DC, uh, we did some DC Mattel stuff, right? Yeah, the Universe Classic. Oh, yeah, line. yeah, all the DC... From the, the Batman line they started doing through the Batman and Superman line, through the DC superheroes, through DC Universe Classics, and now DC Multiverse, where we're doing a lot of that work. We did all of it up through DC Universe Classics, and now we're doing some uh, DC Multiverse stuff here. We just finished two new waves for them on the DC Multiverse stuff. Wow. Is yeah. it just you four guys? No, well, yes and no. I mean, it's uh, A majority of the work is done right here in the studio, but we do have... Um, sculptors that uh, other sculptors and other fabricators that help out with that and then sometimes we'll bring in help from the outside like if it's crunch time like during Toy Fair or before Comic Con or Power Con or something like that 
we'll be, bring in other um, painters to help wrap things up and people to help with molding and casting or or printing cleanup things like that so no it's just it's not just us us three guys we actually have uh sherry cook well the three guys here myself jim preziosi and eric treadaway we're the co-owners of the, the studio but um we also have sherry cook who works here full-time as our painter so 99.9 percent of all the four horsemen product that hits the market is the original prototypes were painted by her she's she's a machine and incredibly talented yeah that's a lot of output her. Yeah, yeah. She's like I said, she is a machine, and she's just unbelievably talented. I mean, and this is that's the thing though. We a lot of times we don't give her the time that she deserves to work on those projects. I mean, they're spectacular looking when they leave the door, but when if she was actually given the time that she should have to paint those things, I mean, I don't believe that she can be touched as far as painting goes in the industry. She's she's absolutely amazing. We're lucky that's to awesome. have her here. Yeah. Well, you guys are, and then uh, we then swatches. we we farm out work sometimes for various uh, digital sculpting and everything. So if there are any uh, digital sculptors out there, um, we're moving into the digital world a bit here. Um, feel free to send us your portfolio. Email us at four hmd at optonline dot net, and we'll take a look at it. My friend uh, Joe Amaro has done uh -huh. some stuff for you guys, like the battle yeah, we know Land. Joe. He's, yeah, yeah. Um, he, um, Joe's done a lot of like. Um, well, at least, it, yeah, definitely prototype work for us. Um, yeah. Some of the stuff that he's done, then we've gone back and tweaked and changed here and there. But for the most part, he gives us a, a really beautifully um, solid foundation, the stuff that we work on. Like, he designed that that battle ram. I mean, he, obviously, he took the original and, and uh, kind of rebuilt it. But, man, the design he did for that thing and then the sculpting he did on it was immaculate. There were only a few minor tweaks and additions that we did to it when it came to our studio he did a, a spectacular job on that thing and a lot of the other jobs that he's done for us too um that's i mean he, he gives us a nice incredibly solid foundation to then get here and like make little tweaks or adjustments to that might need to be made and he, yeah he, he was a valuable resource for that stuff well, you guys, I mean, like I said they're, they're, we can't cover everything you guys do because it's just there's so much um, so we're trying, we're going to focus in just on what you have currently running and that's the Power Lords pre-order. Now, stepping right. back, Power Lords is a line from the early eighties made by Ravel based on designs by Wayne Barlow. Um, and you guys brought it back in, what was it? 2013? Yes, sir. So what, first of all, what prompted bringing Power Lords back? I know Eric Treadaway well, is a huge fan. That's, that's essentially it. What happened was Eric, Eric Treadaway is a gigantic Power Lords fan and I've always loved it too, but I was never... I never collected the figures and I, I was never as into it as he is, but he has all the original figures. I don't think at the time that we started, I don't think he had them all of it, all of them in package, but he at least had all of them loose and he was a huge fan of them. And we had some of the fig. I mean, he had some of the figures in package, but way back when um, we'd always talked about uh, if there was a line of figures that he himself would like to do power Lords was like, his big one, like the, uh, like an oddball, weird line. And so we decided to try to find out who owned it. We found out that Color Forms had originally owned it, and then it, the, 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 the license for it went to these people that ran um, – hey, okay, bye. Sorry, one of the <laughs> – That's it. He's off the show. The <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know how things go. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, – we found out that um, the guy who actually created it lived here in New Jersey, like maybe not even an hour from us. And the people who now owned uh, the Power, Power, Lords, Power Lords license um, also own – what is that? A to no, not Toss Across. Uh, it's some game. I can't remember. Uh, I forget. It's, it's a game where you drop the little chips. Connect Four. Connect Four. Oh, okay. They own the, the rights to Connect Four. I guess their their parents had owned it and everything. And now they own the license. So we were able to get in contact with them. And they were very much on board with us picking up the license and, and doing Power Lords. And then we got to actually meet with Wayne Barlow, the guy who originally created Power Lords. And um, Eric and I were both huge, huge fans of his as well. He uh, created a book called Wayne Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. Awesome book. And for me, when I was a kid, that was like my Bible. 
I poured over that thing so much that I broke the spine on that book. I mean, it was, it was pretty tattered. I, I think I still have it at home somewhere, but I, I definitely need to get a new one of that. Cause it's an amazing book. If you get the chance to look it up, find it and check it out. It's amazing. I have a copy. It is a very cool book. It's very, right? very cool. It's basically yeah. uh, just like the designs of extraterrestrials um, from different fiction books and yeah. gives you the visual look of what they're described as being in the book. Um, right, but in his style, in yeah. his style, I mean, it's just so freaky and out there that it's it just it's a beautiful, done, beautifully done book. So we were able to get in contact with Wayne Barlow and actually go meet with him and talk to him, and he actually had tons of um, drawings and stuff that he'd originally done for that line, and a lot of stuff that had never been produced, a lot of alternate versions of uh, some of the main characters from the Power Lords mythos. Oh, that's so cool. And he um, said, you know, if you guys want to use this, feel free. Just bring it back to me when you're done with it. And so we wow. made And I said, I, we asked him if we were allowed to photocopy. And he said, sure. We photocopied tons of that stuff. Wow. And so we've got a, yeah, we've got a pretty good archive of things that we can draw from as far as alternate versions of characters and stuff. And some of the ones that you see that are up for pre-order on Store Horseman now are like alternate versions or, you know, his his concepts of some of the characters. That's awesome. That, uh, yeah. That had never been produced before. That's, that's so cool to have one of the, the I mean, the guy that designs it still involved yeah. in it this far down the line yeah. to, and then find yeah. out what else was going to happen. And he's, a, and he's an amazing guy. I mean, not only is he incredibly talented, but he's also, he's just a, the sweetest guy you'd ever want to meet. Um, when I took all the drawings back to him, you know, I, he, I, I gushed over him telling him how much of a fan we were of his work and how, how much of an honor it is to be able to work on this line and actually work hand in hand with him on, on some of the designs and stuff. So before I left, he said, you know what, if you want, pick a drawing out of that stack that you oh, want. Like, these are original drawings. There's oh, a lot man. of photocopies, but Whoa. a ton of original drawings. I was like, no, no, I couldn't do that. And he's like, no, no, go ahead, whatever you want. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I, said, I, I can't do that. I said, I'd love to, but I can't. He said, if you don't pick one, then I'm going to go ahead and pick one for you and you won't like it. So I pulled out <laughs> this beautiful drawing he did of the, the original drawing of the Trigor ship. Oh, wow. Power Drive. It's just mm. unbelievable. And all the detail and stuff that's in this drawing, it's like this, I don't know if people are, are, are familiar with it, but it's this like horribly disgusting monster with it, like all of its organs on the outside and sections of him stitched shut and everything. And he's been turned into some kind of vehicle that the Power Lords drive around. It's really, really kind of macabre, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's cool too. But it's a, it's a beautiful drawing and, I swear, if they would have done the sculpture the way that he did this drawing, uh, it, I think – here's the thing. I think the Power Lords was a little bit before its time, and I think it freaked out parents a little bit, and that's why it didn't sell as well as it could have back in the 80s, and it kind of went the way of the dinosaur a little bit too soon. Yeah, I think it was a little bit ahead of its time, and it's a little bit too freaky. But if this thing had been put on the shelves the way he actually designed it, I think people would have like come after – uh, color forms a company who owned it with torches and saying that <laughs> oh, <laughs> some, totally. some yeah. horrible thing they're trying to release it is frightening looking yeah the designs on them are so awesome like all the, the characters yeah. the designs are great but Ravel I mean it's the only action figure line they ever did they were known for a company that was doing model cars um, right so I, I, oh, I said color forms, didn't I? I meant Ravel. Yeah. Color forms was our outer spaceman line we did. Yeah. Uh, um, Ravel, you're right. Yeah, but it, it, they could only uh, do so much back then, and there was, you know, um, manufacturing. Well, yeah, and one of the then. biggest mistakes they made with that line is they, they used the um, the same kind of plastic that yeah. they were making their model kits with. is like this hard, like uh, very brittle ABS plastic, and now – Years later, if you have some of those original toys, you have to be very, very careful if you want to play with them and like put them in any sort of pose because the articulation now will just crumble in your hands sometimes. I have a full set of the figures, um, mm -hmm. and they're all thankfully unbroken, but I'm never going to try the action features on them because once, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, that that plastic would just not handle any kind of movement or um, mechanism inside at this point. I think it would just fall apart. No, but I think you'd be asking for trouble. I think it would explode. Exactly. So you guys are able to take those original designs and actually translate into a figure that's worthy of the design now. Um, you, now you went with, for that, for the, starting off with the line, you went with a four inch scale. Uh -huh. um, what was the decision to go with the four inch scale? Because a lot of people online complain that it's not six inch scale. 
Right. I personally like that it's four inch scale, but what was the reasoning behind it? Well, I, you know, I, my preference is six inch scale for action figures, but if it's an action figure line that um, can utilize vehicles and play sets and stuff, which we kind of envision the Power Lords line to be, especially with a, like a vehicle like Trigor and some of the other vehicles and things that they had, and that, like the, uh, the power the, ship. Uh, the play sets and stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, then I think three and three quarter is definitely the way to go. Um, the technology, the way it is today, we can fit the same amount of detail and stuff into a, a three and three quarter figure as we can into a, a six inch scaled figure. Um, sometimes depending on the style of figure, the articulation might, um, be a little less, but, uh, as for power Lords, I mean, like I said, we wanted to do cool vehicles and cool play sets and just so those things didn't get like crazy out of scale and crazy huge and crazy expensive, we decided to go with a four inch scale for those or three and three quarter is what we were calling it. But everybody seems to switch to the four inch scale, uh, uh, say calling it the four inch scale now. But yeah, that's what we decided to go with just about, pretty much for that reason. At the time, um, also, we were pricing out figures and it was a little different than it is now in that. Um, Four inch doing four inch figures, it was coming in a lot cheaper than doing six inch figures. We've been pricing four inch figures lately, and you know it's it's the the cost of figures produced at either four inch or six inch. It really isn't that much different now for some reason. I don't know why, but um, at that time, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was both the, the the price of producing the figures and the the chance at possibly making cool vehicles and cool play sets for them. Well, I, 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 for one, am a big fan of the four inch scale. I, am I like the six inch too, but there's so much six inch stuff that it is nice to see something this cool in four inch. Plus, I think you guys kind of started a four inch renaissance kind of after that because there's a lot of four inch line Kickstarters now. Um, yeah. That, it, that it, a lot of people are looking at the four inch scale more, I think, and what mm -hmm. it's what you can do in that four inch scale. And like you said, with vehicles and creatures and all that stuff. Um, I am really I think glad. A big, big tip of that hat goes to to Matt Dowdy and his crew over at O'Neill Design, the people who do the Glios figures. Yeah. Because I know that a lot of people are utilizing that uh, the the Glios compatibility. It's a a play system where you can pop apart uh, your figures and like interchange parts and stuff. And the the Power Lords originally had that Glios compatibility at that scale. With this new one, uh, the new wave that we're doing, there's various reasons, but we're not going with the Glios compatibility on these things. But um. There's a lot of other uh, small companies that are starting up that are working with Matt on that and using the Glios system and creating a lot of new four-inch lines. There's a lot of new and exciting stuff happening because of, you know, Matt and him helping young um, new toy designers and, and toy toy making companies, um, helping them along with like production and design on that stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I think that he had a little bit more of a hand in that kind of renaissance than we did but then since then like you said there have been a lot of um four inch kickstarters that have been very successful that um that the people are doing and they don't necessarily use the glio system but um yeah the, at that scale there's there seems to be a lot more uh new companies doing doing that now yeah uh, I, the, speaking of the glios compatibility we're going to talk about the, the current figures in a minute but since we already mentioned it let's go ahead and talk about it real quick um so the first waves, the, the both the the Griptog and his variants, and Adam Power and his variants, all the different Power Soldiers, they utilized that BIOS compatibility, so you could switch out the pieces right. and parts. And you're saying that the new ones don't. <clears throat> now I personally am, am not gonna miss it that much, because mm -hmm. on the Power Soldiers, it was neat to be able to switch out the parts and make your soldiers right. look all different. But this wave of figures, I think there will be less. Um, and I think there's less, I, I don't know the right word to phrase this. Like compatibility exactly. between the various figures. Totally, yeah. yeah like, I mean, it, that's, that, was, that was one of the reasons we, there were various reasons, but that was one of the main reasons that we decided not to go with uh, Glyos compatibility with these because um, even though they're all going to be four-inch scale, the types of figures that we have, the types of characters, they're so varied with the Power Lords that... Yeah. You're not going to be able to take a uh, you know an arm off Disguisor and put it on Adam Power. It's just not going to work. Yeah, it's and, just, and it seems so we, less we useful. Figure, you know what? Let's go ahead and do away with that. It doesn't really make sense to, you know, you might be able to change like 
disguise or and disguise or variant parts or or Adam Power and Lord Power variant parts, but between different character styles, yeah. there's not going to be a lot of interchangeability. And to to sacrifice, you know, possible stability of the character, um, instead of adding in more articulation and new articulation, we just decided let's let's go with the newer articulation and, and not go with the glass compatibility this time. So for this, so for the first batch, it was you had the the Grip Tog, and you had Adam Power, and then a bunch of variants, and you kind of trickled those out over a couple of years of releases. Um, uh -huh. She had some introductory bagged figures, and you had some carded figures, and then you had some more bagged figures and some exclusives here and there. For this time around, though, you're doing things a lot different than that batch, where you're doing 17 figures, basically four new sculpts with um, four to five variants apiece, yeah. uh, and all at once. Now, what was the, yeah. the decision to do it that way? Instead of what you're well, because we've, we've had a little bit of experience doing that with like large wave drops. Here, here's my thing as a collector. I'm a, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm an avid collector. I'm a geek and everything. But when I see um, like a, an action figure on the shelf, and it's maybe one or two figures from a possible wave of figures, I'm not all that interested. Mm -hmm. When I see them start releasing four, five, six figures, and I see that I can start making collection, it starts to interest me. One one example would be. Um, I can't, I think it's Bandai. I can't remember which company is making them, but Star Wars did these like samurai versions of Darth Vader and Boba Fett and Stormtroopers. Is it Figma? And now they're doing Marvel versions remember. of these samurai guys. <clears throat> yeah. And they're beautiful designs. But when I saw the Darth Vader, I thought, oh, that's really cool. But I don't, I'm not really just a Darth Vader collector, so I wouldn't just put that on my shelf. And then a Stormtrooper came out or two. I was like, oh, those are cool too, but you know, a Darth Vader and a couple Stormtroopers, it doesn't really work with my collection. Now they've got a whole collection. They're even doing like Darth Maul, and then they're doing the the Marvel ones. And I, I'm like, oh man, that's gonna like drag me. I, yeah, I, I, now I'm gonna have. Now that I see a bunch of them, I'm gonna need to go back and play catch up. So we have kind of experimented with that with both Mythic Legions and the Gothatropolis Ravens and some of the other stuff that we've done. Mm -hmm. And realize that that's kind of a, a successful formula when you release waves of figures at once instead of just, you know, larger waves of figures, instead of just trickling out one or two variants. Then yeah. sales are slow and they, they may build or people may lose interest. Yeah. So you release a bunch at once and, you know, it's an instant collection. You might, might have to spend a big chunk of change, but you're going to spend this chunk of change over a a year or you're going to spend it all at once and you instantly have this collection of figures on your shelf. So that seems to work pretty well for us. So we decided to go with that model this time and see how it works with Power Lords. It's worked with uh, some of our other lines that we've uh, produced. So figured we'd give that a shot and see how it works. It seems pretty good. Uh, I mean, with other companies, it seems like there has been uh, the risk of a line not getting finished out. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they're doing the one and two figures, like when they did that with Thundercats, it yeah. was, um, right. you know, lion -O and whoever, and then... Bandai. Yeah, and then, and, then, oh, we're, was... and then, oh, we're done, sorry. And yeah. you don't get your collection, so... Well, that and I, I would think that it also helps with costs at the factory, probably, too, to do, like, a larger amount at once, right? And it As does. opposed to, yeah, to, to a, just a couple. Plus, like you just said, yeah. it, it's it's you closer to getting that full line each time. If you have a good assortment right. each time. I also like what you guys did, because there's other Kickstarters, and I feel like sometimes I, I can't get into it because... They keep adding stuff on as it goes along. And to me, right. I, I do like the fact that you guys are like, it's 17 figures, that's it. it here's the pre-order, it's these 17, these are the ones we're going to get. It's not going to be adding more stuff on as we move forward, and if the Kickstarter gets the most amount of funding, we can add in this and do this. I, this way I know I'm going to spend this amount of money, that's all there's going to be, and I'm cool. Um, yeah. So I want to appreciate what you guys did with it. I was able to do the all-in pre-order, cool. and right. I know what's, right. what, what's going to hit my bank account when October comes rolling around. Um, okay. So let's let's talk about some of these variants here that we've got going in this second wave. First of all, there's four sculpts this time. Um, there is the the armored power soldier slash Adam Power sculpt. There is the Psydot yeah. and his variants, Raygoth and right. his variants, and Disguise One his variants. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, now for the Adam Power, there are what? There's how many of him? Um, uh, five. Right? Five of yeah, him, five. yeah. And then... Well, I mean, there's Adam Power and then four variants. Okay. 
And so, and with all the others, there's the the main character, and then three variants of each of them. Okay, got it. So they're, they're making for a total of seventeen figures. Yes, sir. Um, and the figures themselves are twenty two dollars each. If you do the all in pre order, it's three hundred and fifty five, which gives you a discount yeah. if you bought all seventeen separate. Yeah, you get um, a little bit of a discount if you if you go all in. Now, so these these are going to have more articulation this time around. Like you've tweaked mm-hmm. some of the articulation, and got like the ball jointed hips that people were wanting from before. Um, yeah. And there is, it seems like there's maybe a couple of, um, it, it seems like maybe there's some new sculpted elements in, in a lot of the variants, whereas before, you know, there were new things on the Grip Talk variants, but it was mostly just like a, maybe a new head, um, mm-hmm. and they didn't seem quite as distinct as the variants seem like this time. They seem very distinct. Right. Um, right. Now, do you have a fave variant of all the ones that have been shown? I'm sorry. Do I have a what? Do you have a favorite variant or a favorite figure oh. of the second batch? Yeah, I do. It's the um, I can't remember his name. Is it Garg? Garg? Grog. It's the uh, it's the the big ugly red variant of uh, Disguisor. I was going to ask you that about that. Have, one. Yeah, the one that doesn't have a spinning head, the big thug monster. Roar. I, I'm I'm always a big fan of like the the big bulky, almost as wide as they are tall kind of characters um the thing is my favorite comic book character of all time and so that guy he just kind of speaks to me because it's just this big i like disguise or but that guy just has that big beefy bulky monstrous look to him so he's my favorite of all of them i, I like him a lot too and i think it's interesting that he's the odd man out of the disguise or variants because d- uh-huh. there's disguise or deceptor deceivor and they're all obviously in the same vein as each other with their spinnable heads and you've got right. Roar whose name is very much like Roar. one of the Griptog characters, and then it's got the, the two Gs and the two Rs on the end, and he looks right. almost like he's like Griptog, or Griptog, with like the red skin and the greenish yep. eyes. Um, so is that an intentional like kind of crossover between the two alien yes, species? Yes, it is. It's good that you picked up on that. There's a, there's a story behind that that I can't reveal just yet, but yeah, that's a, a little bit of a backstory on that. Okay, great. That's all. Yeah, I thought he was really neat. And it, <laughs> It's a cool way of using that body to give us a different alien kind of species while yep. still fitting in with the other ones but giving something new. I feel the same way about that Shivix uh, variant on the, the yep. Armored Up Powered Assassins. He's obviously got the same facial uh, characteristics as Shea. Yep. Um, so maybe he's a connection to her species, which I think was Maru is the planet that she's mm. from. Um, you really have a good eye, huh? Hey, thanks, man. Uh, there's so, a, yeah, there's there's a, there's absolutely connections between some of the excuse me, some of the other races and characters that you see there, um, but we're not you know, we're not going to reveal too much about that just yet. If this this uh, project actually goes through and comes to fruition, then we're going to have a little bit of that back background on the back of their packages so oh that's awesome a little bit of a teaser about that i'm really surprised that somebody picked up on that so quickly that's really good hey thanks man he's got an attempt he's got an eye for detail yeah i uh I, i've been yeah, pouring yeah. over those pictures since they were first shown and, and i saw that <laughs> certain things in there i was like oh that's that's what well, here's, here's a little little tidbit for you then i don't know if you've watched um if you go to powerlordsreturn.com um is the whiz uh, one of our friends in the industry, well, he's not in the industry, but he's in the industry with us. Uh, he just did a um, a review on all the prototypes that we showed at PowerCon. Yeah. And the blue and white one, Dr. Waybar. Wayne Barlow. His name is, yeah, it's named after Wayne Barlow. Yeah. <laughs> because originally, Psydot was Wayne Barlow's favorite character, and he named uh, Psydot after his parents, Psy and Dot. That's awesome. Dad. Yeah. I, I watched so every cool. one of those videos he put up. Oh, cool. And his, I think his YouTube name is Adam Power, even. And uh, as they were coming up, I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm loving these. I'm loving these. So I noticed the Waybar thing. Like, when I saw it, I was like, oh, he's named after Wayne Barlow. But I didn't know about the Psydot thing until I watched the video. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool. Yeah. That's a cool little – and that's a great variant, too, because it comes with that baby Trigor. Yeah, he comes with a baby Trigor. That is so, so neat. That's that's another question. Now, what, what you know, he's he's like a doctor. And he has this little baby cry, trigord. Is does he raise these things and experiment on them and turn them into vehicles, or does he just happen to have this little baby? I like or to think he just is delivered he it. In this for some reason. <laughs> uh, so why does why does Doctor Waybar have a baby? He, trigord? He's a pediatrician. He, he just delivers the babies and then he sends them. Uh, yep, sends, sends them, them on. on. Cuts the umbilical cord. There that's you it. go. That's it. Uh, he's so that's even though um, even though the Power Lords is a 
a licensed property, with everything that we work on, we try to kind of build a little bit of a story around each character. It's not just, oh, this would look cool, let's throw this out there. There's usually a reason for the design or the look or the character name or the character itself when we put stuff out there. So, I think that's important. I mean, you kind of see with at least three of these characters we just talked about, there's a little bit of a backstory that yeah. we'd like to hopefully hold back some of the surprise and intrigue on some of these characters. I think you have to give people something to, to hold on to other than just uh, an aesthetically pleasing chunk of plastic. It, yeah. it has to be yeah. character development and things like that. I'm That's so really excited. Cool. We, to we totally agree. I, it's it's like when we... I, I, I was pretty heavy into Motu Classics for a long time, and we were getting the story through those bios. I was addicted to those bios, even though some of them weren't the right. best. It was a really cool thing to have some kind of some kind of story going on with the figures. So, and as a yeah. kid, I always loved the file cards on GI Joe and mini comics, um, the little tech spec things on Transformers, the mini comics, anything that where I could get the figure and get something else with it, like a little bit of information or story or something. Absolutely. To kind of you know one get of, my my, one of the my playtime started. We get asked most. I'm sorry. I said it, it kind of got my playtime started. Like it gets your imagination yeah. going. And you take it from there with your toys. Yeah, absolutely. One well, of the questions that we get asked most often when we're at conventions or whatever is when somebody sees um, one of our properties that they're not familiar with, um, they pick it up and they say, oh, is there a cartoon or a comic or some kind of storyline that goes along with this? And every time we just tell them, yeah, you, on the side of the package, often on the side of the package, we have like a little character bio there. And it's, it's enough to give you information about the character and get you, in, and get you interested in it. But it's not enough that it just gives the whole character's backstory away. Yeah, like it gives gives you a little bit a little bit of information. And usually on the back of the packages, we try to try to include um, a little bit of the history of the whole mythos of, of whatever toy line this is itself, too. I think that's enough. And to people, get seem, people to, seem to appreciate that. I think it's great. Get the imagination going for these people. They'll fill in the blanks, you know. Well, yeah. The, the thing about Power Lords, too, is it's not like Thundercats or He-Man or Transformers where it's got all this, this story and, and things you could build off of. Power Lords really only had the three-issue DC Comics miniseries, the stuff that was written on the back of the cards, and then, like, coloring books and a board game. But no, like, you know, lasting comic series or cartoon or something. So there's a lot that you guys can fill in on your own and build up on your own right. to kind of create your own mythos about it, you know? Absolutely, and the, the people who own the license are completely really cool about that and totally open to us, uh, allowing us to do that too, letting us kind of create a new – I mean, of course, we're taking into account everything that's come before, but creating a new story on top of that if we can. They're, they're being totally cool about us doing that. That's exciting, man. I, I really hope that yeah. – I know you guys talked to before when you when Carl Lynch was first coming back about other like media tie-ins, like maybe comics or mm – -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember in Magma Core you had that Dave School like animated short for that, yeah. and that was super cool. So any like yeah, it was great. They did a great job with that. I, I'm hoping that, that there is, you know, is there like a, a, a goal like after the kicks after the the pre order's over and if it goes through, is there is that stuff kind of in the wings like media it's, type it's stuff? It's not yet. I mean, first and foremost, we want to focus on trying to um, hitting the goal for this uh, pre order and and getting this thing to go through and, and actually being able to produce these figures. But, I mean, if it actually does, then absolutely. I mean, that's nothing is off the table. I mean, we've had many, many people interested in working with us for, to do um, Power Lords comics, some Power Lords animation, maybe even like some kind of um, phone app games, things like that. Oh, but, that's cool. I mean, first and foremost, our interest is, is action figures. It's toys. So we want to make sure that that happens first or uh, any of that other stuff to us is just – you know, it's good if it happens. It's all icing on the cake, but it it doesn't matter to, to us as much as the toy line itself does. Well, that's a toy line first and foremost, which is great. And so, if the market's there for the actual toys, then that'll prove if the market's there for the other things. I um, think so. So that's that's awesome. Um, so the the pre-order is up now, and it lasts until October sixth, right? Yes, sir. And that's at storehorseman.com. Because I want to make sure we get that in there before we forget to say it or something. So storehorseman.com. Yes, it lasts until October 6th. Um, there are a couple of And the of money will not you, – you'll use your credit card. The money won't be removed from your credit card until, you know, if, if we actually meet the goal that we need to hit, if um, then that's when we'll uh, start collecting money from credit cards. Um, you may see, especially if you're a new buyer, you may see a charge that pops up on your credit card saying that you've been charged, but you won't. That's just the store. It automatically – 
like um, I guess the credit card company runs uh, your card through processing to see if it's a real card and everything. Just it's for safety. Yeah, and then that charge will drop off there in a couple of days. We've gotten a couple of emails asking about that, saying, "Oh, I got charged," and I'd email them back saying, "Just wait a couple of days. That charge actually will drop off your card, and you won't it won't show up on your actual bank statement." Yeah, my, so mine when has. When manually it. process the orders, then that's when we'll collect the money from the credit cards. Yeah, it's, I, I've got the temporary charge on mine now, but I, the minute I saw it, I was like, okay, well, that's just a temporary hold that's going to drop yeah, off. Yeah, a couple of days, that should drop right off there. And then after October 6th, about how, I mean, will it be pretty immediate after October 6th that you know whether or not you hit the goal that you'll yeah, be able we'll to tell know. everybody? I mean, right now, we're, as a matter of fact, I mean, if you're on the on on the fence about uh, whether you're going get, to get on board with this or not, go ahead and do it because, I mean, we expect it to be, be a little bit farther than we are now. We're only about a quarter away there. Um, it's going to have to meet our goal. We just can't can't produce the figures. Um, and that's totally understandable. So, and I think you guys are really fair with the pricing on this batch too. You can't be making a lot, keeping them this low with this low of a production number. Well, well, I don't know if you saw the uh, the post that I put up, but we were we were literally fighting with the factory to get the prices down on production because. The original prices they came back with it, this was as much as the 6-inch Mythic Legions line. That's and crazy. I don't know how that's possible because they're half the size and, you know, they articulate, they're articulated. They're highly articulated and they have great paint detail, but not nearly as much as our Mythic Legion stuff. They don't have nearly as much as far as, like, accessorization goes and our separate armor pieces and things like that. So how they were coming up with the prices they were coming up with, we have no idea. And we found out that they... I don't know. They somehow miscalculated in mm-hmm. quotes. Uh, that. Uh-huh. And I think they thought we'd just go, okay, let's go ahead and run them. And they didn't think we'd come back and say, wait, what's going on here? Yeah. But yeah, we fought fought back and forth with them until the day we were going to be putting that pre-order up. Wow. We thought we weren't even going to be able to put the pre-order up because we weren't going to be able to get the prices down to a point where we thought that people would want to pay for them. So yeah, we, we kind of lucked out there. We, we were scraping right at the very end to make sure that that – price got down to where we could could put them $22 is a little bit still more than we would like to sell them for but I mean that's that's where it is our our factories that we use are normally very fair they're very professional on that stuff but this I don't know they had a brain glitch or something I'm not sure what happened but well, we finally got them down to a place where we could reasonably price these things so I, that's where we're at at this point if, if the quality is as, as good as this first wave is then it's well worth it because the paint quality on those first ones, the four inch, the, the Adam Power, the Grip Tollers, all those variants were incredible, especially like the carded ones. Cause on the bag ones were obviously they were um, a cheaper version with less paint apps. Uh, but the carded stuff, the paint apps on those is incredible. Um, that Adam Power and that Grip Tog are just awesomely painted four inch figures. I also love, they have like a flat coloring to them, like a flat paint uh-huh. instead of a super glossy, like, a lot of times you'll see yeah. that stuff gets super glossy with paint, and not so on those. Those were great, beautiful painted figures. Right. Um, well, um, the factory that's doing the uh, new Power Lords figures, uh, or that's going to be doing the new Power Lords figures, is the same factory that did our, did our uh, Mythic Legions trolls for us. Oh, those are and great. those came out just spectacular. So, I mean, I, th- I really think that uh, these guys are going to do a, a bang-up job on the, the Power Lords figures as well. So I'm not even going to address what the game plan will be if the pre-order doesn't go through, because basically it, the pre-order needs to go through, because then it proves that the, the audience is there, they're willing to get it. Um, anything else that's a secondary plan afterwards is going to be going, okay, well, we know we can only sell this amount, so it's going to be tough for us to make this work. When we already right. know. That's, that's exactly the thing. I mean, it absolutely, we absolutely do have to hit that goal. And even at the goal that we hit, if we barely make it, we're still going to do it. We won't be making any extra money on top of it. It'll be enough that we can produce the figures and have a little money to move on to the next wave of the figures and actually start production on those without having to to kill ourselves. Um, But if it doesn't meet that goal, then uh, the only way we could produce the figures is to do them at a higher price. And I don't think anybody wants us to do that. And, And yeah, I know we don't want to do that. We don't, you know, I don't want to sell these things for 25 or 30 bucks. It's just, to me, a four-inch figure should not be that expensive. Totally. Yeah, I, I just don't see them them being that expensive. I, and it's probably because I'm an old fart or whatever. <laughs> we, just, we, we all are. We all, I we, see, uh, there are a lot of lines out there that, you know, the, the four-inch figures. Uh, for instance, 
Boss Fights has that Bucky O'Hare line yeah, that is thirty-five dollars per figure. Yeah. Those are beautiful, yes, incredible figures, are. and I am a huge fan of Michael Golden, the guy who did the uh, the Bucky O'Hare comic for Continuum. And these things look so much like his artwork, and they're just beautiful. Yeah, but yeah. I'm still very hesitant because maybe we're five dollars a piece is a lot to pay for an action figure. Now these. They're highly articulated. They're beautifully sculpted and painted. They come with a lot of accessories, and I know what production costs, so I understand where that price is coming from. Sure. So, I mean, it, it, I'm sure they're well worth it if you're a collector that has to have them, but I still have that that hesitation that, wow, $35 is a lot to pay for a, a little four-inch figure, and it is, but, I mean, that's just kind of the way things are now. Yeah, yeah. that's what it looks like, and we're in the same boat, and it's like, you're going to have these niches show up. I think like people who really, really want and have to have a Bucky O'Hare and who are all about it. Yeah. will probably go in for it, but you know, we're kind of on the fringe of that. I, I, I like Bucky O'Hare a lot. I like the comic. I like the cartoon. Cool looking, great looking figure, but uh, not, you know, not, um, not for me. It's not, it's not $35. So, yeah. I, I... But, but as long as you have that core fan base, uh, -huh. um, showing up to support things yeah. I, I think i think it'll and that may be one of the reasons i mean obviously they're probably paying some sort of licensing fee um right it, right they probably understand that it's a very niche market for those so they're going to have less sales so they price it a little bit higher to cover that aspect of it right. too i mean there's a lot of a lot of things that go into the pricing i mean it's not just them i just picked that out because sure. that's a line that i've seen recently yeah. that's roughly that scale that i'm very very into and i think it's beautifully done and it's yeah. It's hit a price point where I'm like, mm, man, that's tough to for me to to justify that, even though I completely understand why they have to do it right. at that price. It's a shock now, but I think that people are gonna, you know, start getting used to this uh, twenty to twenty five dollar range for the four inch figures yeah. because every the 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 way the Kickstarter, the small companies, um, that's where everything seems to be headed. I mean. Yeah. If you want something cool and unique and different than just another Batman figure or Spider-Man or something, which those those are fine too, but um, a lot of people our age, I think, are looking for other different stuff and stuff from their childhood. I, I do agree with that. And that's the way it's going. So I, I'm in the same boat where I think we discussed it on the show here before too, uh, where we really like it, but like you said, the price point is a little tough. But I think, like you said before about us being old fogies, that it plays into a lot too. Where yeah. we're older, so we we know what we used to pay for small figures. So we've yeah. we've become accustomed to that growing up. And for people that are getting into it now, it's not that bad. Bad to them. You see, I went into Toys R Us the other day, and they had these. I guess they're figure arts wrestling figures. Yeah. And they're probably five inch figures, and they're forty dollars each at Toys R Us. Oh. Yeah. And it's crazy. I mean, you, you can look at other wrestling figures that are there, and they're 10 bucks or whatever, but it's because they're a higher-end thing, and they've got the extra heads and the different articulation, and it's probably a much lower production run than what Mattel's doing with the actual mm -hmm. wrestling figures. So in the back of my head, I'm going through all these things to justify this higher price, but to a lot of people that are collecting that kind of stuff, it's they don't even have to justify it. They know that Absolutely. this is what you're paying now. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, it, to, to really, really date myself, I remember when the Star Wars figures first came out, and I was finding them at stores for like three dollars and fifty cents each. And it's like, yeah, you you can't even imagine a figure being anywhere near that now. Totally, so, man. It's just it's just the, the way things go, I guess. You know, I'm like I said, I understand what production costs are, and I understand you know why they would have to price it in certain ways, but it's kind of hard to swallow. But it's just it's just the way things go, I so guess. It is. Yeah. So okay. Um, so back on to the, on the, I started oh. to say a few minutes ago on the, the as far as the Power Lords, you you had said something about you know um, the variants all have like little different things. They do. One of these things about the um, the disguise doors that we haven't revealed yet is each of those dial faces that you can spin and change faces in there. Yeah. Um, each one of those disguise doors has a different disc in there with different faces on it. That's awesome. So you're going to be able to pop that apart and like swap the faces oh, on different that's way cool. that have, have different faces. I think each face has four. I mean, each each disguise or has four different faces on that wheel. I'm not exactly sure. The original disguise or had four. four. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's four. 
And so the other, the variant disguise doors have diff four different faces on each of those discs. So I, and they're I, pretty cool. There's one that looks like a piranha. That's my favorite. I, I like the um the the bone colored one, and that one is yeah. called uh, Deceptor. Yeah, um, Deceptor got a lot got a lot of love at PowerCon. He's People really, really neat. Love him in person. I, I love his his faces almost seem like skulls inside yeah. there. It's really really neat looking. Just really awesome designs where you guys have kind of extrapolated on what Barlow had done. Plus, I mean, obviously, like yeah. you said, there's other stuff that he'd done that we didn't ever even saw. But all of it right. kind of just still fits in that world. Anything that's new still fits in with what we saw before. It's really awesome. Um, Here's the thing. I want to get to the third wave so we can me do too. Arcus. So me we can do Shia. Arcus is my favorite Power Lords character of all time. Yeah. And there's this cool little um, simian drawing. It's, it's like this little... I don't know, like a gibbon looking guy uh that Wayne Barlow sketched up in his designs that I want to turn into a Power Lords character too. That's it, awesome. Uh, has never seen the light of day. But uh, yeah, I want to get to the third and fourth wave of those, so Well, I, I wanna I, really I wanna want ask to see you, this go through. I wanna ask a couple of questions. I wanna talk about the future, but I wanna ask a couple of questions that I've read online um just really quickly about the current ones. Now the some of the side out well all of the side out variants but not side out himself show an extra head uh -huh. in the picture but in the description of what you're getting it's not listed. Do, does well, do they come with those extra heads? Here's the thing: we want to if this goes through if it barely scrapes past then we may or may not include extra heads with the figures. It just okay. depends on on you know how the costing works out. But if this actually passes and we make a decent margin on it, then we want to include var a variant head, at least one variant head with every character. And like uh, for the Skyzors, it would be a variant wheel. Oh, that's for cool. Every character, yeah. So every character you can you you know you buy two or three and you can pr turn them into two or three different characters if you'd like. Well, I'm hoping that's, that's our hope. Fingers crossed. But we, I know that we had we didn't have the the heads listed in uh, the descriptions. And some of them had like a variant head shown yeah. with the character. That's just to show you what the possibility might be of having variant heads with these. That, that, okay, that makes complete sense. Yeah, because that's the first place to start cutting costs. We learned that when we were collecting Motu was that a good way to start yeah. cutting costs is including those. It extra really heads. is because I mean, as, as hard as it is to, to believe, a lot of times the heads on characters cost more than most of the rest of the figure as far as paints go because. Yeah. There's a lot of paint detail and a lot of paint applications in one head. So mm -hmm. cutting a head out of a, uh, a package, a variant head, saves a, a, a figure a lot of money in production. Well, I, I'm hoping that Shavix then gets his three-eyed human-looking head. Right. If he yeah. were to have that ability, like Shea or Shia, however you want to say her name, if he were to have that ability like her, it would be cool if that was the extra head. I'm just saying. Um, yep. The other question was Sidot's armor. He's been shown with it and without it. Uh -huh. um, does he? Is his armor come off, or it's does removable. it? It is removable. Yeah, and we're going to try to do them if we can get the factory to do them. We're going to try to do it in, in the armor pieces in an ABS plastic and do them in um, uh, like a vac metal, oh, like sweet. chrome look. Yeah. Yeah, because the vintage one had and both vac metal and, and just regular silver or grayish. Yeah. But the back metal yeah, is way they're, cooler. They're going to be like back metal red and back metal whatever oh, the cool. colors are. That's awesome. And the um, uh, all the Ragos will come with two separate chest plates. One, you know, you can leave the chest plate off, and you can just see that that strange uh, mirror pattern that they all have on their chest in different colors. Yeah. Or you can put the clear uh, chest plate on, so you can actually see that through there, and it kind of gives it a different look. Or you can put a we have a, a flat colored chest plate. It goes over it where you completely obscure that all together, and you can take those colored ones and mix and match them with, between different uh, Ragos to give them a different look too. That's awesome. I like the the customizability of the whole yeah. line. Um, even if you don't have the Glios compatibility, you still got a lot of customization you can do on these characters, yeah. which is awesome. Um, another question that people had was why was there maybe no army builder packs this time? Like people that want to buy multiples. Uh, say the the power assassin um is there a possibility of maybe adding in say like we a might actually pack? do that um we actually have gotten a couple emails the reason we didn't do that normally when we do our army builders 
We do that as a – what we call in Mythic Legions, we call them Legion Builders. And what they are is they are pretty much the same characters that you get in a regular Mythic Legions uh, figure pack, except sometimes they'll have a little bit less accessories, and they definitely always have less paint. Uh, the paint saves us a lot of money if we, we yeah. do much less paint application, and so we can pass that, that on to customers. And rather than a, a customer paying – $35 for a fully painted, fully accessorized Mythic Legions figure. If we cut back on the paint and make it a very basically painted figure, we can drop that price all the way down to 22 for the customer. So yeah. we create these Legion builders that people can collect those and, and, and build their armies up. Um, with Power Rangers, we didn't do that with any. We whoa, didn't whoa, like whoa, create whoa, any. Whoa. Wait a second. You said Power Rangers. Oh, I'm sorry. Power Rangers. You Power gotta, Lords. That's you got to nip that in the bud, in buddy. <laughs> Power Lords. <laughs> Uh, we didn't do that. We didn't create any Legion builders, but we will go back and pick um, probably uh, a couple of them out of uh, each group and turn them into army builders or, or create some way that you can do like an army builder kind of thing. with. Okay. Them. Yeah, that was something we, we kind of considered, and then we just didn't because we just didn't hadn't created any lower-priced uh, army builders with them. But we'll, we'll see if we can do that and maybe add something in, maybe – make a couple of very basically colored ones and throw those in there and see what happens. So for people that do want to army with the ones that are fully painted, they should put the pre-order in for as many as they want. Cause that with every bit helps. So if you sure. are, feel like you're going to want five of this power assassin, put in the pre-order for five of them. Don't just put in for one and think you're going to buy four later on. Put the pre-order yeah, in for You can all always five. go back and, and cancel your order and then order something else if you want. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, you really <laughs> got to get as many as you want right now. Because yeah. every bit of those numbers is going to help this go through. Because if you I, wanted, I completely agree with that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you may Anything want to get this to go through. We'll totally. We'll, we'll try to try to push it that way. Yeah. So if you if you think you might want five later on, then put in the order for five because you may not get any at all if you don't pony up now. Um, it's true. This is true. Okay. So moving forward, if we make it through this one, um, oh, the other question was. Oh, we already talked about that. I'm going to skip past that. Um, okay. moving forward, so the future of the line, we, we managed to do, the first one we only got two of the vintage characters out, this one we're getting out three of the vintage characters, so the, the, there's another, there's, we've done four, it would take another, what, one, two, I'm trying to remember how many vintage figures there are now, top of my head. Uh, um, I don't remember off the top of my I head. I think there's there ten quite, total. There's still quite a few left, another couple waves at least. There's ten total, and you've covered five. If, if we get through this, we've right. covered five. So for the next wave, are we looking at maybe another three vintage characters and one new character again, like this wave that's is? That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's the way that we should do it. If, if this goes through and it looks like it's going to be popular enough that we're going to be able to do more waves, then the way I think that we should do it is do at least three of the – uh, other vintage characters and one or two very, uh, um, I'm sorry, one or two new characters that, you know, had never been seen before. There's also one that was done in like a little wind up style that was never released as a figure in the toy line. I think it was called, was it called Jester? I can't remember what it was called. Uh, but we want to do that one as well. And we okay. want to take some of, uh, Wayne Barlow's designs that weren't turned into action figures and, and do those too. So for the wave after that, we'd probably do two or three. Uh, vintage characters to kind of wrap up all the vintage characters and then another one or two of the uh, new characters. I, I like that the importance of it, it really is obviously by showing that the majority is going to be redoing a vintage instead of introducing something new. I like that, that trying to finish off yeah. something first before you get too far into the extra stuff. Right. Um, and like you said, Arcus is slated for wave three. He is also yeah. my favorite of, of all of them. I think most people will count him as, as their favorite because he's such a cool design. And yeah, man, I want that Arcus figure. He's insanely scary. He is so odd and cool and such... I mean, he fits... You put him next to Skeletor and Megatron and all those guys, and he is just... Even if you don't know Power Lords, he's such a cool design that he just looks awesome. Uh, and he, really he stands does. up to all the other ones just because his design is so great. And I cannot wait us to take that thing and articulate it the way that it needs to be articulated because if you have that original Arcus figure from the 80s yeah and you, you don't do not try to play with that one now because I'm certain with how, how thin the joints and everything were on that that it'll just absolutely shatter oh for sure 
I, mine yeah, stays in really one position and never moves. Thing, but it can't. Um, the uh, it, it is still. I mean, it, it's just great what Ravel pulled off back then, though. That's that's a very yeah. highly articulated, skinny little figure. Um, yeah, it is. And so, it, had they used better plastic, it it would be probably still hanging on and still be one of the best articulated yeah. figures of that early era. Um, I think so. But I, I can't wait to see what you guys actually do with him finishing. Uh, or if you if, if we if we finish off this pre-order and make it into it to see him in production would be awesome. Um, so yeah. please, people, pre-order so we can get to that. Uh, vehicles and play sets. You've already said that it it's something you guys want to do, but again, that's all going to depend on what happens here, right? Absolutely, it just depends on the success and the popularity of the line and and how well it goes and how well it continues to go. Well, I think that about covers Tri everything. Trigor is my personal favorite. We have the drawing. Oh yeah. Here. We want to we want to make the vehicle exactly like. Wayne Barlow's original design drawing. So, I mean, that's that's one that I'm dying to do. Even if this line doesn't come to fruition, we may have to go ahead and sculpt that and print one out here just for us. That is awesome. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to have to come over to the studio and maybe walk <laughs> and out with one of those. Yeah, maybe, maybe sneak <laughs> yeah. one. Uh, so, and, and that's a cool one because, it, like you said, the design is really cool. It even looked cool in that DC comic, but man, it is disappointing as a toy because they had to do that whole do back yeah. thing where you. Put, they pulled the thing off and stick the figure inside of it, and it was uh -huh. kind of strange looking. Um, yeah, very weird. All right, again, storehorseman.com. The pre-order runs until October 6th. We're going to have a link. We're going to put this up on YouTube, and then we'll have a link there, and we'll also have it on our website and everything. Um, wow. Is there anything else you want to say about Power Lords before we move into a couple thing, uh, other things here on the show? No, I mean, I, I just I appreciate everybody who's uh, jumped in early and, and uh, helped us out with this pre-order. Um, Keep spreading the word and, and uh, keep preaching the uh, the gospel of Power Lords because we really want to see this thing go through. We want really want to continue with this line. We don't care if we make money on it. We're just fans and we want to we want to make these toys. So get in there and help us out uh, however you can. Even if it, even if you can't afford to jump in and pay now, please spread the word. Yeah, it's it's such a grassroots thing that if it does go through, the feeling that you helped it happen. Makes them, I don't know, makes the, the figures mean more to you. Like, when they show up at your door, you're like, you know what, if this couldn't have happened had we not done this. Like, have we not yeah. pointed up and done it now? So the feeling that you are you are a part of something is pretty cool. So, I mean, if you want to yeah. get in on this line and feel like you're a part of it, it's just no different than when they get the GoFundMes and the Kickstarters to get a project going, and then you put your name in the credits or something like that, where you feel like you're a part of it. Get in there and at least throw in a pre-order for one or two of the figures. If you, if you find one or two that are interesting, um, and it's only 22 bucks a, a pop on those, just get a couple of them. And then if it happens and it goes through and you have an opportunity to buy more of them, that's great. Um, yeah. But just get in on it just for a few. Just do just it. Just for a few, guys. Come on. All right. So, yes, um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? You said sweet. Okay. Yes, please. So there are a few things that we do on the show that are like our, our trademark things in the show. Um, and there's there's two of them that we want to do with you, Corn Boy. Um, one you know about, the other one you don't know about because it's kind of like a surprise <laughs> thing. Uh, we do this thing, or Mike has done this thing for years. Back when I was collecting the Motu pretty heavily, he would come, we worked together. He would come to my work and he would leave these letters to Mattel on my desk where he would come up with his own He-Man characters in case Mattel runs out of ideas. These were supposed to be like from an anonymous fan and they're kind of dumb. Yeah, they're kind of dumb. No, they're, they're not. They're dumb <laughs> ideas. And and every time I would get one, I would crack up. And he's been reading them on the show because we kept them all. So every once in a while, we'll do a letter to Mattel, and it'll be a list of ridiculous figures. Uh, this time, we both worked on a list, and we've got a guy here that actually will listen to our letter to Mattel that's connected to Mattel, that works for Mattel. So this is a golden opportunity that we can't pass up. Um, yeah. So you're going to get our letter to Mattel right now. Are you okay with that? Sounds like fun. Yeah, sure. Let's do well, this. You, you, famous last words. It's probably not going to be that fun. <laughs> no. but, all right. So Mike's got the intro of the letter, and then we're going to run through these characters for you. Dear Mattel, well, it's happened, and we bet you never thought it would happen. A special team up between my friend and myself. He likes He-Man 2, and I've been told it takes two to tango. So we got together and put our dancing brain shoes on to come up with some scorching hot ideas that will help improve toy sales. So before business negotiations get in the way, we're going to give you the goods while they're still hot. Right. You want to go first or me yeah. go first? Slandor. Political commentator on Eternia. Comes with goggles. Huh? Pretty good. <laughs> Did you say Slandor? Slandor. Slandor. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Yeah, I love that. So here's the next one. 
Debitor Credits, <laughs> one of Preternia's big spenders. Evil fiend with the ability to legally dispense Preternia bucks if you mail away for the secret code number. Also has a microchip used to confound his enemies. They don't know how to handle him. <laughs> Corporal Grievance. I, that, I know people <laughs> like that. I don't know if I care for that one that much. <laughs> Too close to home. Yeah. Uh, Corporal Grievance. This is nothing like Star Wars. Uh, General of the Elite Evil Soldiers, Grievance uses his three regular arms and one smaller arm to lead his armies into battle with the do-gooders of Grayskull Lair. <laughs> no, nothing like Star Wars. All right, you ready? Yeah, go. Good Wildor, heroic hero of used goods, uses his ability to sell gently used items against Skull Brain and his minions. <laughs> Includes extra capes that don't fit other figures. Nice. Only he can use them. Only he That's can use them. Just for him. Yeah. <laughs> That's gonna cost extra. He's got them available yeah. for everybody. They're gently used, but they don't fit anybody else. <laughs> I have a, I have a love hate, she, a love hate relationship with Goodwill. So <laughs> Goodwill. I'm kind of on the fence about that one. <laughs> Goodwill. Uh, I used to work. love going shopping with uh, at Goodwill until uh, we went shopping there with my mom and my mother-in-law, and they would spend all day in there. And they would, like, <laughs> That's a hard place to spend all day again, in. So. That, that's why you need Goodwill Door. He does it for you. He'll, yeah. He'll take care okay, of it. Okay, well, that'd be good. I could, I could handle that. Bring me back all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> if there is any. Uh, next up is Boa Conscriptor. <laughs> this scuzzy screenwrite was contracted by Skeleton to plot out He-Man's demise. Uses a magic typewriter and requires batteries. <laughs> all right, you ready for another one? There's only a few yeah. more of these, poor boy. You just gotta. I only have one more. You just gotta suffer okay. through. I've got three yeah, more. You somehow. were right when you said this probably wouldn't be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one. His name is Char Lee Horse. Oh man. Watch out for this bad guy. He rides a steed and pulls muscles. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Char Lee Horse. Oof. I fully expect. He rides this a steed. To, <laughs> I fully expect it to see these made by you guys. Poor boy's gonna hang up pretty soon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, my last one is Horde Hat. What was that? Horde Hat. Horde Hat? Horde Hat. Okay. Evil informant of many disguises, mostly hats. That's all you got. <laughs> That's it. All right. Mo mostly hats. I have two. That one's perfect. That's the winner for me. Yeah, that I have, was my favorite, too. I have two more for you. Fist right. E-Cuffs. That's put out the same way as Manny Faces. That's, I think I had one called Fist e Fist E-Cuffs. This heroic warrior has hands that are almost too big to fit in standard cuffs. Also wears a sleeveless shirt. Why not? <laughs> because his hands are too big for the sleeves. Hey. Almost too big for standard cuffs. Please, you can still cuff him, but it's tough. Sleeveless shirt, so it doesn't even matter. And the last one I have is forehead. The number four <laughs> hyphen head. So you can probably see where this one is going. Evil okay, scumbag yeah. has a lot of space between his hair and his eyebrows. <laughs> He might be related to T-Lor in some way. <laughs> Not a feature. And he evolves into five heads. Yeah. <laughs> the forehead, it's teasing you, thinking he's going to have four heads. But it's just describing his forehead. All right. All right. Sorry about that. Sorry, we, we, have, we had we to get out of our system since okay, you're here. That's okay, man. That was good. You so have a top five, good. correct? We're awful. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do a top five list. We do a top five list on the show a lot of times. Uh, and this time, it's the top five toy lines that we would love the Four Horsemen to go back and redo. You guys are the king of bringing back old toy lines. You brought back Motu twice, Power Lords, yeah. basically superpowers in the way of Beast Universe Classics, Thundercats. You guys are the kings of it. Um, so we Thank want you. to do our top five, starting at number five and working our way up. We each take turns. Uh, toy lines we would love for you guys to redo. We're going to try and not do any toy lines that already have a remake going. Um, right. Cornboy, you told me you cheated on something, and we'll find out what it is soon. But Yeah, a couple of things. I'm, well, I, I, it's kind of cheating, kind of not. All right, well, we'll, let's, see. we'll, we'll find out. So, Cornboy, you want to start us off with your number five pick? Uh, my number five would be uh, from the movie Kroll. Now, Whoa. I know that there was never an action figure line made of Kroll, and that's tragic because... There were some cool characters and some cool monsters Heck in that yeah. line. You could have had some great action features, you know, him throwing that glaive at people yeah. and stuff. I mean, it, it would have been a great line. And That's a cool idea. that nothing was ever done with for, done for that line. You, you did get a call 
toy line, yeah. and you could just use those. Cool. You could yeah. use those <laughs> with the rooted hair. Not yeah. quite the same. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had the Atari game for Kroll, and I loved that game. That was such yeah. a cool Atari game because you had to go into like the the spider pit thing, and you had to throw the the disc and catch it, and if you lost it, you're out of luck. It was a really complicated yeah. Atari game. It was really cool. Um, good one, man. That's a good one. All right, I'll go next, I guess. You want to have the last? Yeah, you can right. go next. My number five is Captain Power. Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. That is a good one. I Gary guess, Goddard still retains the rights to that. Okay. Um, and that was a total when, uh, I remember when my son had those little Captain Power spaceships, and he played that silly game that came on the. Yeah, uh, yeah. VCR tape. Yes. And it was awful and didn't really work well. <laughs> no, it was but terrible. Had fun anyway. But there were cool he ships and cool anyway. characters. Yeah, I just like yeah, that you really could look did. through his chest and he was just yeah. a gold guy. Anything with back metal eyes was cool. It's some cool fun. villains in that too. Yeah, yeah. cool villain designs. Number five for me is Tiger Sharks. Mm. Now mm-hmm. I, I uh, that that would fit right in with Thundercats, and that I think the Rankin and Bass did the animation for that too, and mm-hmm. LJN did the toys. I can't remember Frank and Bass. The toys that, that were animation. out for one week. Yeah, exactly. And I've told the story on the show a ton of times. When I was a kid, I loved that cartoon, um, and I was dying for toys. And back then, you didn't know what toys were out until you saw them in a store half the time. Uh, we went to, I believe it was, we went to Kmart first, and I got a Fright Features Janine. And then we went to Toys R Us, and there were Tiger Sharks figures there. And I begged my mom for one of these. She's like, you already got a toy. Can't get two toys on one trip. Never saw them again. Bullshit, mom. Yeah, I know. I never saw them again. And that it's, and I it's have cursed the, me since then. And I had the same experience also. But I actually like those designs, and I yeah. like the cartoon better than I like Thundercats. Yeah. Maybe sacrilege to say yeah. that, but um, I would have loved to see you guys do Tiger Sharks. All right, what's your number four, Coin Boy? My number four, and uh, it would be higher, but because I really loved this line when it was first released, even though I never had any of the actual big beasts, I had a lot of the little... The little uh, rider characters with dino riders. Hmm. I freaking loved wow. the action figure line. Yes. Uh, I would love for us to get the chance to redo that, but I don't know how likely that is. I will say that's the first line that's on all three of our lists. Oh, really? Because I'm looking at yeah. Mike's list and I see it on there. It's on my list. And well, you you guys have named one that's on my list, but I'm not going to say, say it. it. I'm not going to mention where right, that is. I'll yet. say it. We'll get to it. Uh, right. Okay, so right. what's your number four? Mike? My number four is Air Raiders. That's a good one. You remember Air Pretty Raiders? Obscure. Yeah. Very yeah, obscure. That's a good line, too. And those little <clears throat> little guys that were in the Air Raider ships, I had a few of those. But I yeah. think my son might have collected those, and they, he kind of lost the little figures. And rather than let them remain lost, I picked them up and put them in my collection. Yeah, they were smaller than, <laughs> nice. they were smaller yeah, than Mass figures. He lost them. But they were... Yeah. Under quotes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, really, exactly. really cool look. And, right, yeah, that's it. Number four for me is Dungeons & Dragons. I almost put that. Dungeons and Dragons. I think you guys are doing that. Kill that's called that. Mythic Legions. Yes. Yeah, you want, but exactly. Yes. It's yes. Mythic Legions is very close to what I would want out of a Dungeons and Dragons line. But to see those actual characters from that old line yeah. redone by you guys would be awesome. Um, there were some yeah. really cool designs, and I think that it would translate really well. And even though I'm not a huge fan of the six inch scale, I think that they would really work in six inch scale. I think those would be yeah. awesome. All right. Yeah, I'd like to do that too. That's not on my list, but that's that's actually doing some of the characters from Dungeons and Dragons or any, uh, we've had a lot of people that have requested characters from various different uh, mythologies that would fit into mythic legions. It just, it would be awesome to be able to do some of those. Yeah. What's your number three? My number three is kind of cheating a little bit, but the only reason it's cheating is because nobody has ever done this line right. And it's, it's one because I'm selfish. Um, I've wanted to do, since I very first got into toys, and we've gotten our chance to take a stab at a little bit here and there, but it was only like certain versions that we were allowed to do or certain artists' uh, versions of the characters, but it's Fantastic Four. I knew that was and coming. I know that Marvel, I mean, I know that uh, Hasbro is, you know, has released The Invisible Woman is going to be releasing the other three as well now, so there's a little bit of a resurgence for them right now. But I do not feel, especially with the thing, that proper justice has ever been done to that action figure. I agree. Yeah. I can't think of a definitive... There's some good, good versions of the characters out there, but there aren't you know, what I would consider my perfect comic versions of the characters out there. Eric Treadaway sculpted a, uh, a thing figure for me for Christmas one time. Oh, that's cool. Um, it's partially articulated. It's articulated at the waist, the shoulders, the wrists, and the head. 
and it's just absolutely beautiful. It's like a perfect mixture of it's got a, a very John Byrne style head, but the body is very much a cross between John Byrne and Jack Kirby, and it's just so gorgeous. And we've always wanted we got to do a thing for for uh, Toy Biz, but it was based on the Mike Waringo drawing, which is good, but it's just you know not the one that we wanted to do. We've done like uh, Invisible Woman, Human Torch, some others that were very um, I think they were based on the most recent Fantastic Four anima- animated series, and uh, we've done some that were you know, more based on artist designs rather than, than, uh, what we really wanted to do. But yeah, that's, mm. that if it weren't for the other two lines that I have in number two and number one, that would be my number one, just because I'm selfish. Hey, I totally understand, man. I would love to have a, a great, like Kirby set or John Byrne yeah. set, either one of the fantastic yep. four. Um, I think that the fantastic four classics that, um, it might be the one you're talking about the thunder launch thing. Came with that weird engine thing. I thought I think that's the yeah, closest yeah, that's really the, Toy Biz got. Yeah, we did that one. That one's great. I love that thing figure. <laughs> that's, that's um, Mike Waringo style thing that we did for Toy Biz. I actually made that ugly, stupid engine thing. That engine thing <laughs> is, is very Kirby-ish, though. Like when I got that, I was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of Kirby-ish. Um, yeah, it's, it's supposed to have a little bit of a Kirby look to it without going too crazy. That for now, that's that's my thing figure, and I, I don't think that that's going to be. I don't know what Hasbro has planned for what they've got going with past you know the, the read and stuff they've shown um for now that's my go-to thing figure um and i don't awesome. see him you being topped because he's great you have a four horseman thing figure in your collection you didn't even know hey, look at that there you go oh, look what I've got. <laughs> all right what you got for number three Mike? number three is centurions that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one we all know okay um there, number- there, there are a lot of choices that we could have put on this list i actually cheated a couple of times and i feel bad about it but no I feel that bad. It's Don't good variety, <laughs> you know. It, we you can yeah. be a cheater and we'll stick to the rules and we'll have a good amount of variety. All right. Uh, number three for me is in humanoids. I was wondering if oh. that was going to get make your you guys list. would kill at that. Yeah. Those yeah, big giant creatures. Awesome. You know what? Those three large ones, the Meltar. Uh, They're still good. Decompose and uh, Tendril. Tendril. I I have all three of those, and those are still fantastic. They're still figures, great. But yeah, it actually be able to go in and put the kind of detail into those that we did into the troll figure. God, that'd be amazing. That and the, that like the fun. main figures, I, I think that they are kind of lackluster by yeah. today's standards. And I think that seeing you guys do those would be amazing. Not just the three big ones, but all the regular figures. Those would be very that cool. Stumpy, yeah. was that the one that the tree's name? Is that the one that was called? I can't remember what it was called. But that. the weird kind of cree, tree creature. Yeah. You could, it had light pipe eyes. Um, that would be cool to see you guys do. So it's it's a line with some really cool monstery designs that I think you guys would rock at. Yeah. What's number two for you? Be fun. For me, number two is one of my cheats. Um, and it, it's uh, one of these was mentioned earlier, but since we started doing Masters of the Universe, the classics for Mattel, the three lines we wanted to do in the same style and scale were Thundercats, Silver, Silver, Hark, Silver Hawks, and Tiger Sharks. Yeah. All three of those in the same style and scale as Masters of the Universe Classics. And we've gotten at least to do part of Thundercats, and maybe someday we'll be able to continue that and finish that off. But my number two is both Silver Hawks and Tiger yeah. Sharks kind of done in that same combined them. Masters of the Universe Classics style and scale. I've seen some Silver Hawks customs made from your um, from your guys' figures. I think Joe Morrow's done some. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and that that would be yeah, that's fantastic. Seen, I've seen a bunch of both Silverhawks and Thunder. I mean, uh, Tiger Sharks done in the Motu Classic style, and it's they look fantastic. They I really do. Fit right in. I had a feeling when you said that there was one that was two in one, like a bonus one, that that was it. That you could find Silverhawks yeah. and Tiger Sharks. Did you get yeah. Silverhawks, Tiger Sharks, and Thundercats? Those cartoons that are was, that was a trio. Yeah, was, all together. Yeah. And even though LJN only handled two of them, and Kenner handled Silverhawks. Um, yeah. They still work together. Man, you know what was great was that that Kenner sculpt on hardware, the little gnome yeah. guy. Yes, yeah, yeah, that looked that dead really on. Great. That was a great sculpture. That looked dead on Rankin and Bass. That was really really yeah. cool. Um, what we're number two number for you, right? two for me is uh, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice. Uh, and I, I don't even know that line. It's well, it's a it was a '90s cartoon, and Mattel did uh, did a they just had one line out. And they were they were knights, you know, but they were colorful and they their armor was kind of updated. Um, and oddly, you're oh, wait. Attila, you're oh, Att- that's it's from the nineties. I remember yeah. that line. You're, the Attila right, right. figure from your Mythic Legions looks a lot like Arthur. Very much so. The yeah. color scheme and everything. So that was you. You kind of did it. 
So it's already done. <laughs> it's done. You should be putting on your list. Yeah. Uh, yeah, number two for from... more from that line then. <laughs> number two for me is Dino Riders. Um, Dino Rider. I think this combines everything that you guys would be mm-hmm. killer at, like big dinosaurs, all the mechanical stuff on there, and you got all the human characters in these kind of sci-fi meets fantasy outfits. And you've got the bad guys. They're like these weird lizard creatures with domes yeah. on their heads and stuff. Um, yeah. And then there's like the snake guys and the ant guys. Man, you guys would rock at those. Uh, I'd love to get a shot at that. Dino Riders would be killer. Especially if it was even close to the same scales because then we could have these big dinosaurs that still have those little detailed yeah. sculpts. Yeah, the little um, guys, I think. Man, Dino Riders would be awesome. Yeah. All right, agree. so what's your number one, man? My number one, and anybody who knows me would probably have guessed, and we probably, to be absolutely honest, wouldn't be the people to do it because we just about probably re-release what's already been done, just kind of update slightly, but I would love to get a chance to go back and redo Micronauts. Oh, that's cool. My favorite toy line of all time, and to go back and redo that in that scale with the the vehicles and the interchangeability and the, the cool character designs, especially the... The aliens and stuff, yeah. like Moros and Membros and Antros, uh, Antron, all those guys would just be, ah, I, I would be in heaven if we were able to do that. That would be awesome. And it seems like Micronauts keeps having this, like, herky-jerky, you think it's going to come back, and then it kind of doesn't yeah. come back. Then, yeah, oh, like, um... It's going to come back? It's not going to come back. Yeah, it was released a, a few years ago, um, and then just recently, uh, I think it was, a, yeah, Comic-Con, uh, Hasbro released a set of like all different kinds of characters. There was Transformers and G.I. Joe characters, and there's tiny little Micronaut slug fig- figures that were yeah. like less than an inch tall in there as well. But, you know, nobody's really taken it and done done them justice from, from the originals, I don't think. And I'd like to do that. That'd be fun. That's great. That would be a great one. What's your number one, Mike? Well, my number one's Dino Riders. There it is. Yay. All three of us. <laughs> so you guys basically have to redo Dino Riders. Since- yeah. That's yeah, the one common yeah, I think that's a must now. thing on all three of them here. A runner-up is Barnyard Commando, so. That's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a stretch. That would be a fun one, too. <laughs> I'm not sure that it would be a line that we would want to do. Maybe if we yeah. did them more realistic would be cool. But I was, well, that, that's I was joking like that, pretty much, but I could see you guys doing it. I don't know if you guys are still around at McFarland when he did those, like, techno spawn creatures where oh, it was, like, yeah. animals with all the techno parts all over them. Yeah, yeah, that was like one of the last things we were working on when we left. There, there you go. There's your Barnyard Commandos. It's that's, basically that's why you left yeah. there. Yeah, that's the, one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Todd came in and said, "I want Barnyard Commandos." That's one of yeah. the reasons. We're out of here. I would have stuck around if it yeah. was that. My number one is Silverhawks. Uh, I had all yeah, the Silverhawks cool. as a kid. Love that line. Um, and I, it like it's already been said here. It's it would be right in with the other two. Um, yeah. It's it would be really really cool to see you guys pull that off. I'm wondering who has the rights to that at this point. I, I have no idea. We haven't even looked into that at all. I mean, when we found out that Mattel was going to be doing Thundercats, where we had the chance to work on that, we absolutely like mentioned to them we should try to get Silver Hawk and Tiger Shark yeah. too. But you know, just just getting Thundercats in there was a miracle enough. So mm. we went ahead and stuck with Thundercats, and then well, we all know what kind of happened to that yeah so. that's a bummer maybe someday yeah and, and the doors someday. never closed i mean no not completely uh, i want to throw in some honorable mentions up and runs with it the door's always open yeah some honorable mentions that i had um battle beasts i think you guys would be great at but it kind of has uh, i'm a huge battle beast fan fan i'd love to do those those would be awesome but they had those mini mates and then there was some kind of like i think it was like a japanese line that was going to happen yeah of those uh, so i kept it off yeah. the list because it kind of had yeah, one already uh, the, and those those releases i mean if you're into like the mini mate style the kind of square and blocky style they were nice they were they were really well done for what they were just yeah. not something that i was really into totally me too uh visionaries which i kept off the list because hasbro put that one visionaries figure in that pack so kind of right. like, ah, well, it kind of counts as they're redoing it. But those so are basically should, nights with holograms. What's that? So then I should have left Micronauts off. You're allowed to cheat, remember? <laughs> we have super yeah, rules. Right. You're allowed to cheat. Um, yeah. Visionaries, I think, would be cool because knights with holograms. And holograms are awesome. Uh, and then the last one for me I, was... I have to be the blasphemer here and say that I was never really a big fan of the Visionaries line. What? So, I know. Really, I know. No, like, that was the end like of the, the show. Kinda, I just didn't like... Kind of like the, the the blockiness of the torsos, and they were oh, all flat man. with that. The figures themselves there, right? did have a, a, yeah, have like a an odd structure, and I guess it was. Yeah, what what I would like to have seen done 
was, you know, if, I mean, this is if the Four Horsemen redid it. What I would like to see done was, would, would be for them just to have had like kind of nor, normal torsos, but then you could remove the par- front part off, the front half. Yeah. And then oh. their bodies wouldn't be so misshapen and weird looking. And then you could see the, the, the holograms inside them. Oh, that'd That's be cool. That's kind of cool. That'd be cool. And not just have that be just open there all the time. Yeah. Just looking at a big open. Black You're talking head. about nocturnals. Oh, yeah. Nocturnals, You're... nocturnals yeah. You're talking about nocturnals, visionaries yeah, with the oh, little wait night a guys. Yeah, I'm talking about nocturnals, yeah. not visionaries. Um, right. Yeah, that's different. The little night the visionaries guys. Visionaries were the one with the what's that? The little knights with the little hologram right. like visionaries plate in front. Little night. Yeah, those were cool. Yeah, those would be and their holograms were really sharp back then. They're, I mean, they still look great. Yeah. These, to this day, the holograms are great. But, but I, I was just about to say nocturnals would be cool for you guys to do too, and that's exactly what I would want out of them to do that irreversible piece and then look at it underneath. So it's a normal right. figure, and not just this hologram sticker all the time. Right. Um, yeah. The last one for me was Defenders of the Earth, just because I want oh, a good yeah. Phantom figure. Yeah, I would love a good Phantom figure. I would love a good Flash Gordon figure, honestly. I- I'd love a good Mandrake figure. Let's have them all. So go ahead and make Defenders of the Earth, guys. Give me Lothar. All right. Well, well the wait a minute. The um, didn't didn't somebody just do a Kickstarter that had a Phantom figure in it? Mm, I think it was like five points of articulation. Was uh, that like I'm talking about the Amazing Heroes? I think. Uh, yeah, I don't maybe. think he was in there. No, he wasn't. He was no, he wasn't. But it seems like he should have been. I think Phantom is maybe slated for the next wave, or I think he's oh, trying maybe. to be a Phantom, maybe. Yeah, I think it I was. I can't remember what it is it exactly. Was talked about. Oh no, no, it was. Um, was it um uh, part of the Captain Action thing? For oh, Zika? maybe. Maybe Zika. Uh, it could would, be too. It might. It might be part of that. I, don't I can't know. remember. The Phantom seems like a, an action figure that's been bun- done a bunch of times, but I really only think it's been actually done once, maybe. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, they maybe did those. Those terrible street players ones from the the movie. That yeah. peanut head from the phantom peanut head. from the from the movie. And I think yeah, Charlie awesome. Flat got one out in Amigo style at one point. Oh yeah, probably. That doesn't but count to me. I don't yeah. want Amigo style. All right, so I guess that's it then. We've we've eaten up enough of your time. Um, again, just to throw it out there again, Storehorseman.com. October sixth is the deadline. Get your pre-order in from Power Lords. Horn boy, we cannot thank you enough uh, for, for being on the show. Pre-order right now. Pre-order it right now. Get on there right now. Stop listening to the show because it's almost over anyway. Just go to storehorseman.com and place your pre-order. Um, sure. Dude, we can't thank you enough for being on here. This has been awesome. Oh, thank you. It was fun. Um, you were a blast to have on here. Uh, maybe if this one goes through and you start up another pre-order, we'd love to have you on again. Uh, and we can, you know, you can cheat some more. And we can write you another letter to Mattel. Um, Sounds good. He doesn't. We, he doesn't. Yeah, no that. more of the letters to Mattel, but the rest of it's good. You're still gonna get it. That's too bad. <laughs> um, and hey, if any of those characters show up in the Motu line, we're gonna have to have a talk. Yeah. If I go in, if I, if, you guys, you guys can expect a little compensation for that. Huh? If if I go on Super Seven and I see uh, Charlie Horse available, yeah. um, we're gonna have to have words. Um, we'll okay. On it. You will. All right. So we're gonna sign off on this one. Uh, Cornboy, stick around. Don't don't hang up your phone just yet. But we're gonna stop the episode. Here. All right. Uh, so we're signing off on this one. This has been James, Mike, and Cornboy. Action oh, it's features. been Action Features. We'll talk to you guys next time.